Hi, I'm Mitch Gallagher. Welcome to the Sweetwater Minute. This week on the Sweetwater Minute, we are joined by a very special guest, Grammy-winning drummer, the world's most recorded drummer, John J.R. Robinson. Thank Thanks you very much. In. It's good to be here, Mitch. Appreciate you being here. You're doing some sessions here at Sweetwater. Well, I think I've become now more of the world's most recorded drummer after all the dates. We, <laughs> I think we're uh, we're on uh, song 14, getting nice. ready to start. And nice. uh, not bad in a couple days, right? Uh, yeah, well, you know, this producer's a slave driver, so, right? <laughs> so it, it's it's all good. But uh, no, everything we've done so far has been. I can't wait to hear the record. Nice. That's yeah, great. Yeah. That's great. And you've been out here before. You came out on behalf of uh, DW Drums. John Good and I are like best friends, and uh, I've been uh, fortunate enough to be a DW artist for a little over seven years now. Mm -hmm. I've always played their stuff, but uh, become an official artist uh, years ago. And and John and I uh, have several things in common. We love wood. The right. guy's just the wood guru, and we love uh, football. There you go. So, so you know what? What more important? What, what, what things are more important? Now? You kind of got it all covered there. But uh, John was uh, uh, built this kit uh, for Sweetwater, and it's a cherry gum cherry kit, and it's just absolutely special, and uh, it's been able to to accommodate you know this v wide variety of music that we're we're cutting. Yeah, right, right. And you've got like five snare drums that he sent out that, uh, oh, he, that you know some incredible stuff there. He sent out the Heisenberg, yeah. which is uh, just a very special drum in itself. Uh, he set out a, thir a three by, I don't know, a five by 13. Uh, he set out a, a six and a half by 15, just this monster snare drum. Right. A steel and, uh, and then a five and a half uh, a cherry gun that matches this kit. So, right. And what we've done is, and I've done a bunch of different tunings on so far on all 13 uh, songs that um, I think blend you know well with you guys and right. uh, and with Cat's vocal you know right so, right right very cool and uh, and I, let me just interject that as uh, you know I get to play a lot of sessions with a lot of different artists and and mm -hmm. uh, probably my female to male ratio is probably sixty five you know percent female and uh, it's a pleasure uh, having her in the studio at, and you know. Uh, as as great as she sings, and uh, her time is phenomenal. But most importantly, she's a Chiefs fan, and she brought cookies. Oh well, cookies. That's right, and, and they were the shape of arrowheads. <laughs> so, so I'm like I'm like really uh, you know very very pleased to have her here. On right, that, right. Know. So you're originally from the Midwest, Creston, from, Iowa. From correct? Creston, Iowa. Yeah, right. southwest of Des Moines, right, north of Kansas City. And you got started very early. I was. Uh, my dad uh, forced me into piano at age five, which okay. I did like, but he was kind of a tyrant with uh, practicing. And I know that any five-year-old probably takes that a uh, little bit to heart. And he's like, come on, you know. And I, ah. right. But then my mother, you know, got me, got me playing drums and she'd sit me down as a little boy and, and play me big band music constantly when I was, and just play it record and record and record over again. So I'd listen to Buddy, I'd listen to Group, I'd listen to, you know, all these old, older, older drummers. Mm -hmm. And um, she uh, taught me the word swing and what it meant. So I started playing drums between seven and eight years old. Wow. Wow. And, and had my first uh, band when I was 10. Nice. Made my first dollar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you graduated from high school, went to Berkeley, correct? Went to directly. I got out, out of Iowa. I, you know, I was kind of like, I can't get out of Iowa soon enough. And uh, <laughs> then you realize when you're gone, you know, you kind of miss the, yeah, the sure. Midwest. And, uh, they went directly to, to Boston and uh, went straight through college, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then you know dropped out like any normal human being and right. went on the road you know. with Rufus. I I didn't join Rufus right away. I was in several bands, and mm -hmm. then uh, I uh, joined Rufus and Chaka Khan in 1978 in Ohio when I met them. I, I was on the road. So. How about that? Yeah, back in the Midwest again. Right. Yeah. So that took you to Los Angeles. Yeah where you connected with Quincy Jones. That is correct. And what was one of the early sessions you worked on there? Uh, well, the first session I worked on with Quincy Jones was, uh, he produced our band Rufus and Shaka Khan, and it was a, ma a record called Master Jam. Okay. And it was before we had signed with Warner Brothers, we were still on MCA, and um, it was a great record. It, was, it went platinum, and uh, you know, I got to get a song in the record, but it wasn't a single. But it was really cool to kind of you know reunite and do this thing. But at the exact same time, I was asked, uh, you know, do you do sessions outside of your band? Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes band guys can't or won't. Right. And I says absolutely, because I was the recording drummer at Berkeley. So um, mm -hmm. I said, yeah. And he goes, well, why don't you come in on Thursday and and uh, bring your drums? And I didn't have any cartage or anything. So a bear, our old roadie. You know, he had an old 63 telephone truck. We threw my drums in there, 
set them up, and I recorded uh, Paul McCartney's song, Girlfriend, and uh, David Foster Carol Bear sang a song called It's the Falling in Love. Mm -hmm. And we consider those B-sides. And okay. uh, I could see them you know, behind the glass going, um, they get, you know, milling around and they're talking, and all of a sudden the talk back goes down, and they go, what are you doing Monday? And I go, well, I'm nothing. He goes, well, would you like to come back and record the rest of the record? And I go, yes. <laughs> you know? So we, I come back Monday, and then, then I see all the cats. You know, I see Greg Fillingains and you know, David Williams and all these other players were there. I think Wawa Watson was sleeping on the couch. And uh, that's when we rec recorded Don't Stop Take It Enough. Mm -hmm. Right when we cut that, all of us looked at each other, and, and we knew that we had had a number one record. Nice. And then for there, it just, it just took off. You know? Right, right. Now, I read that you actually kind of put together a 15-year plan for your, your studio session work. Yeah, Can you wow. talk a little bit about that? Uh, you do do some homework. Well, uh, I do. Yeah, I mean, I said when I moved to Los Angeles, I was assuming that Rufus and Shaco would continue to work, make cool records, maybe split up now and then and get back together. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the key words were split up. Okay. So the session career took off, and mm -hmm. I said, well, you know, you know, Jeff Picaro was an influence, and Steve Gadd, and so I watched how their session careers went, and, and I said, well, you know, 15 years into this, probably, that's long enough, you know. It's, I, I didn't think that, um, you know, it, it would be going over twice as long as that now, you know. And, right. And, um, uh, you know, that we had, a, you know, the 80s were great, I think, for all of us, mm -hmm. you know, and there were times in the 80s when I was on 20% of the top 100 tunes. Wow. And, you know, that didn't last a long time. And then the 90s came and, you know, grunge ruined the world. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and so did MTV. Yeah. Um, just being totally honest. Right, right. But, um, you know, but it's all about songwriters and, and, and artists that can, you know, believe in these songs. Mm -hmm. And if you can get those two accomplished, you know, we're, we're, we're frosting, basically. If sure. we can help change the world, mm -hmm. you know, in some sort of a context uh, in, in a song, uh, that's, that's worth its weight in gold. And, and I right. think I've been fortunate enough to work with great songwriters to sustain, you know, what we do as uh, musicians. So since then, an incredible list of credits. Everything from We Are the World to Clapton to Steve Winwood, obviously Michael Jackson we talked about, Natalie Cole, an incredibly long list. But you're also doing film and TV work, including the Oscars. Right, and I've been uh, fortunate enough to be the drummer for the Oscars for about five years now, and I've done it before that also on and off. But I work with the great composer William Ross, mm -hmm. who is uh, Barbara Streisand's uh, conductor, and he has to have me, so uh, I do it. And, um, right. I've seen some amazing things behind the scenes. I bet you have. Uh, and you know, we, we record that is the whole orchestra is at Capitol. Hmm. So the rhythm section, the brass, and all the all the woodwinds are in A, and then the, the strings are all in B. Mm -hmm. And they we have a sliding open door with the conductor in the middle. So it's an amazing thing. And uh, we run um, through fiber optic cable down the street to the theater in real time. So it's a it's a and a, a lot of people would think, well, there's a delay there. No, it's about 10 milliseconds. Huh. It's just quite, quite extraordinary. That's so, incredible. So we, uh, we're doing the Oscars again in 014. Hmm. And you were, we were talking about this the other night, and you were saying that what you actually get is a huge book oh, of it's all a big of the book. music, and when they announce the winner, you have like one second to get the right, right um, Unless we've done that as a pre-record, mm -hmm. you know, because there is a lot of pre-recording at Capitol. Right. But, uh, you know, like certain acts, like last year, if everybody remembers, uh, Shirley Bassey, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, or you know, Dame Shirley Bassey coming out and singing Goldfinger, you know, and we had a a, a piece of music prior to that, which which was this James Bond montage, and then that led directly in real time, and uh, it was it was very challenging. Right. So yeah. right. So film work, TV work. You mentioned, for example, that. Uh, you and John Patitucci did, were with uh, Kelsey Grammer on the Frasier, uh, the, the credits, yes. music and stuff, and lots and lots of stuff like that. Yeah, ham and eggs, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So you've got, you've got film work, you've got TV work, you've got record dates, and then you're also touring drummer with Barbara Streisand, uh, and David Quincy, Foster, Jones. Quincy Jones, and David and, Foster. And, yeah. um, so which of those is the most challenging? Writing checks. Yeah? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I've become a professional check writer. I, I don't understand how I've become that. But. <laughs> Years of practice. Yeah, but... Um, you know, and I take a little bit, uh, I don't do one thing all the time, mm -hmm. because you know, I, I, I get antsy, and uh, you know, I also have a couple of solo records out. Mm -hmm. I'm working on a third one, um, 
you know, which is very slow when you're wearing all the hats, you know. Sure. And uh, but but yeah, again, those all those artists they don't tour constantly. You know, David will go out and he'll do benefits. We do the Muhammad Ali uh, Parkinson's a benefit. We do that every year. We've I've done that for the last 15 years. Mm-hmm. We did Andre Agassi's benefit and built his schools for God. We did that for 17 years. Um, we do uh, all, all sorts of different things with that. Barbara uh, usually does not tour, but when she does, like we just got back from Europe and Israel, mm-hmm. which was really quite fascinating. And then Quincy, we just got back from Europe and Asia. Literally, those were two back-to-back tours. Right. Uh, not that not that long. Mm-hmm. And then and then uh, come back to L.A. for for uh, studio work. Mm-hmm. You know, the jingle business is is really kind of gone. Yeah. You know, in the old days, we'd be fighting uh, New York players or Chicago players f- to try to get on jingles, but mm-hmm. that stuff is basically non-existent. Um, film work in Los Angeles is extremely uh, viable and lucrative. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I'm the drummer on The Hangover, for example. Okay. Hangover 1, Hangover 2, and Hangover 3, which I did not like that film. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, you know, The Hangover 1 was really quite extraordinary. Uh-huh. And... Uh, uh, I'm the drummer. I was the head drummer on Men, Men, Man of Steel. Yeah, I'd like to talk about that because that was, if I understand correctly, it was two sessions, 10 drummers on one and 12 drummers, and it was everybody from Sheila E. to Jason Bonham and then and yourself. That's Can right. You talk a little bit about that, what uh, what was going on there. Well, I've been fortunate to work with Hans Zimmer a lot, and mm-hmm. uh, he was just a brilliant composer, and he's, you know, he has a, some basically a little bit more avant-garde ideas instead of your normal conventional uh, scoring. And even though he... You listen to his you know, legit music and these scores, they're just quite extraordinary. Mm-hmm. But he, I did uh, Pirates of the Caribbean 2 uh, years ago, and he called me up. He goes, I'm really tired of taiko drums. You know, and everybody knows what taiko drums are these big uh, oriental or Japanese drums you play with big sticks. And, and if you get enough of them, and they've made samples of these, and every composer uses them, mm-hmm. and they're overused. And because uh, these big action scenes need that low end to you know keep people moving. Right. Well, we decided to do it on that movie where we would be th- use three drummers. So it was myself in the middle. I had Abe Jr. on my right and Vinny on my left. And it snares off, and we're just reading fly stuff, and uh, and it was quite amazing. And the concept worked. Mm-hmm. Now, cut to a year ago, uh, I get a call, and he goes, "We need you to be the lead drummer of all these egos." And, and we went in a semi, uh, in, in an oval, and we were at Warner's soundstage for the first time, and that was the 10 drummers. We'd set up, each drummer brought his own specific style of drum set, and we'd, we'd cut all these grooves in unison at different volumes, from piano sonoro fortissimo, mm-hmm. and different tempos, and then we'd match some of their concepts, and then we would overdub toms and crashes, and then, uh, and then we ordered o- overdubbed Grand Casas, big bass drums. So that was session one, which was a couple of days with the 10 drummers. Mm-hmm. Some time went by, and I had a meeting at Hans's studio, and he said, I don't like the sound of Warner's soundstage. We're going to Fox. And Fox is magnificent. Mm-hmm. And we had a larger set of drummers. So I drew out where I wanted specific drummers. And we called the date, and everybody came in. And that's when we had the twelve drummers, and um, it was it was really good. Mm-hmm. And we did the same kind of concept, except this time instead of the toms and cymbal overdubbed overdubs, we used uh, timpani. So all these drummers, after we'd cut all this, the trap set parts, were all playing timpani with sticks. Hmm. So I looked at everybody's timpani head, and every <laughs> one of them was trashed. <laughs> right. You know, so you know right. the cartridge guy, somebody's making some dough. Yeah. But, right. But if you listen to the score, it's it's just magnificent, mm-hmm. you know, overwhelming. Oh, that'd be fun. Yeah, it was. Yeah. yeah. So you mentioned uh, going into a session and having to read uh, all the you know fly uh, fly specs or whatever. Yeah. I think a lot of people wonder how much reading is there really in session work. For me, it's a hundred percent. Is it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, I mean, we're reading on these dates, mm-hmm. you know. But um, I, I I prefer to even if it's a, you're in some sort of a rock band. And, you, you know, that garage band concept is where you just play it over and over and over again and memorize it and learn it. Right. I still, uh, I still like to see, see my space and see my... Even on the Streisand band, which, I, you know, I'm running a 65-piece band. 
Mm-hmm. I, st- I may have everything memorized, but I still have the music in front of me. Okay. You know, it's, it's, I think it's good, and I think it's, and, and I'll say this to the young kids, it's very important, if not extremely uh, imperative, that they learn how to master reading. Okay. Okay. And a reading will not get in the way of your groove. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know. Uh, something I've really noticed listening to you today, and of course with your, your catalog uh, the last couple of days, and then your, your discography, is how, when you play all the different styles, whether it's a pop tune or a funk tune or an or- you know an orchestral, big orchestral thing or whatever it is, it seems very native to you. Like you've been playing that style your whole life. How did you develop that proficiency with all of those different musical styles so that you sound so natural playing them? Well, I'm really a polka drummer. Okay. So that's well, that the, explains yeah, it. yeah, and you know I'm very very good at this. So <laughs> I mean that's really kind of what it is. Okay. No, I'm not. I mean I I don't know. I got hit by the uh, by a, a good beam from God. Mm-hmm. You know I'm I'm able to. Uh, I mean, I was always taught to listen first, mm-hmm. uh, and that even has to do with human communication. And um, you know, it, 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 when I first hear a song, I immediately memorize it on the first run through. Okay. And, and I've played on so many songs that you can understand that maybe that section may be switched to this section. So in my brain, I know that maybe that C section could go here where B is, or whatever. Or, we may extend that or something. And then I listen to the demo. And what, what do they want anything specific? Uh, and then uh, if it's some just rad fill that the writer or the producer's in love with, mm-hmm. I'll notate it verbatim. But I'm still going to play it my way, even though it's maybe the exact same rhythm. Or I won't play anything. So, And then by take two or three, we usually have it. Yeah, I was going to ask about that actually because watching you work these past couple of days, it's pretty clear that by the second or third take, you've got your part pretty much nailed down. Do you think if you go past that, you start to lose the field, you lose the vibe, or what starts happening? Yeah, uh, maybe in my. So I've been playing drums for fifty and a half you. years. I mean, I mean the recording. I know, and that's when I, I turn I turn a bit selfish, you know. But um, and I realize that it, I, I I expect other guys to to learn at my pace sometimes, and mm-hmm. I'm not necessarily saying that I'm learning that much quicker or even as quick. Mm-hmm. You know, it depends on on the song. So, sure. uh, but um, I mean, if it's kind of I don't know, it's just trying to make your team, you know, win. Yeah. You know, on on each song. You know. Well, it seems like it really maintains the spontaneity of the performance, and you capture that fresh energy, so it doesn't start to sound kind of. Too well, I, I mean, without being a name a bad name dropper, I mean, I I worked with Bob Seger on a, on a record, and uh, mm-hmm. the the producer, which will go nameless insisted on 25 takes per song. Wow. And he didn't care if take three was great or take 10 was great. We need to do take 11. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm going, and you know, when you're tuning snare drums all the time to try to match take two, mm-hmm. it's difficult. Right. You know, so it, it does. It, it takes away from the, uh, uh, I think the magic goes away. Mm-hmm. It's like bands that over-rehearse, you know, I, I, uh, I, when we reunited Rufus and Shaka Khan in 2001, uh, which I pushed really hard to do, we went out with Earth, Wind & Fire. Mm-hmm. And uh, Earth, Wind & Fire was using Pro Tools. Well, we would just come on stage and just blow them away without, we don't need any Pro Tools, let's just play. And if you start really, I'm gonna play that same solo every night. It's just, it's not right, you know, but you, know, right. you still have your guidelines. But, mm-hmm. But uh, I don't know. That's just where I come from. Right. Yeah. Right. Last question for you. So, if someone wants to move into being a session drummer, or maybe get a tour with an artist, those kind of things, what should they be doing to prepare themselves? <sighs> In ten words or less. Wow. No, you can you can take more. Don't time. get married. <laughs> Twice. <laughs> no. Uh, um, uh, first of all, you got to be clean. Mm-hmm. Uh, you need to have great time. You need to be a leader. Um, you need to have your master your craft. Mm-hmm. Uh, you need to be prompt. Uh, you need to control your ego. Um, you need to not fall in love with the lead singer. Okay. As a drummer. Okay. <laughs> Producers are okay. That's okay. All right. <laughs> Um, so it's interesting, though, that of those many things that you mentioned, there are only a few of those really were musical. 
Oh. You know, a lot, a lot of them were personal kind of things, conduct kind of things, if you will, behavior your kind of things. Well, I mean, I've heard stories of fellow compadres uh, that there could be issues there. But, you know, I mean, and I, I you know, let's, let's talk about as a drummer. You know, I, I always say I have 10 fingers that I know of. And, and I, I want to master every possible style of music in all 10 fingers. You know, I mean, I don't think I'm a very good East Indian drummer. I might want to throw that one away. Now, I know some of my, my fellow drummers have studied East Indian music as a trap set drummer. And I go, that's, I'm very happy for them. Mm-hmm. In my particular case, I don't have time for that. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm raising kids and grandkids and, and writing and, uh, and doing a whole bunch of other things. And um, I also don't spend 100% of my energy all the time on music because I have to get away from it to come back to it to make it even more special. Mm-hmm. You know, there, I know that there were, we used to hear about drummers that would practice 12 hours a day, constantly practice, 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 practice. And then, you know, who knows what happens when they get on the gig. It's probably a drum sh- solo show. Right. And uh, in reality, what you need to do is learn music, mm-hmm. listen to all styles of music, um, you know, and I personally like music from the older days, you know, uh, I think uh, even up to, you know, the mid-70s, uh, I, you know, I'm, a, I'm kind of that guy. Right. And I, and I like to listen to old mainstream jazz from the 50s mm-hmm. uh, because those guys were also setting the bar really high. Yeah. So, uh, and it's not dissimilar, mm-hmm. you know, they're all, they're all still on the bandstand. Right. So I guess if that helps a little bit. Absolutely. You know, you know. Great advice. Yeah, thanks. John, thanks so much for coming in. It's been a pleasure to have you here, listening to you play on the tracks. Thank you. Of course, those beautiful DW drums, they just sound incredible. Well, you know, and it, John Good doesn't know, nor does this place, but I'm taking these home. Oh, well, congratulations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's it's going to set up really well in my in my studio. Nice. Mitch was on it, man. No, it's our pleasure. And, and I want to thank uh, everybody here, and, uh, and uh, Mark and uh, Kat, of course, for being a great artist, and Sweetwater. Thank you guys very much for having me, and uh, we'll see you again. Thanks. Wonderful. I'm Rich Gallagher. Thanks for joining me for the Sweetwater Minute.